unless we make it one. That's what I always say. Otherwise, it's a challenge and an opportunity. That's very true. And that voice was Stephen Murray. And you're he talking to the ghost man of radio station. And where is, who is Stephen Murray? He lives in Las Vegas. He's a, a, a author. Originally hailing from where I am, Great Britain. He's an author of four self-published books of fiction. They are The Chapel of Eternal Love. Wedding Stories from Las Vegas, Return to the Chapel of Eternal Love. Marriage Stories from Las Vegas, Murder Board, The Queen Elizabeth II. Discreetly Yours, The Chapel of Eternal Love is a fictional novel, an anthology. And he's going to tell me more about the books anyway, so I'm not going to really read more about the books, because it defeats the object of the interview. And uh, all the four books have received five-star ratings on Reader's Favourite, which is, I presume is a, some sort of magazine somewhere. And he's going to say hi to me now. Hi, Stephen. How are you today? Thank you, uh, Mark. I'm j- doing just fine. Thank you. How about yourself? Everything considered? I'm OK, considering my geography is rubbish. <laughs> If you wonder why people, I said I was south west, east, and of course we're south west. I'm going to. I, I I must remember from geography, the pig was on the other side, not the le- right side. Is on the left side. Ah, <laughs> oh, there you go. So, Stephen, tell me a little bit about what inspired you to write. kind of an accident mark i have to confess um i'd never really thought about writing but i have traveled very extensively throughout the world and lived in several different countries and been on all five continents and one day i just suddenly got the inspiration to sit down and i thought i i should put all these experiences from these different countries and cultures down on paper and you know what what my impressions were and how I perceive things and different ways of lives and customs. I spent two years writing that. And um, then uh, I was told people don't read that stuff. They're not interested in that kind of stuff. And you've got to write women's fiction. Well, by then I had discovered a real joy in writing. And uh, I stumbled across the idea about writing a fictional novel of a Las Vegas wedding chapel. I mean, after all, Las Vegas apart from being the gambling capital of the world, we are the marriage capital of the world. It's a strange dichotomy, but that's what we are. And um, so that's how I came to write the chapel of eternal love. It was an accident, really, I have to confess. But it's taken me on an enjoyable path that I haven't regretted. Hmm. And did, was there any of the, the um, stories that you wrote inspired by anything you've happened to you in real life? No, it, it was, it's pure imagination, Mark. Um, I did have some visitors from Belgium. Um, they were a client of mine uh, from my computer business. And when they were here, they wanted to go to a wedding chapel. And they were staying in a, in a hotel, a casino. And I took them to one and we just started talking to one of the couples waiting to go in and as I was driving home that night I thought, oh, you know, I've been told to write a a book for women uh, because women are the ones that do the reading and I thought that would be an interesting topic, you know, why do people come to Las Vegas to get married and all these stories just popped into my mind. It's literally 100% a figment of my imagination. I didn't do much research on the wedding chapels. I mean, we've got over 50 of them here in Las Vegas. Um, I just didn't do, do any research. It was just all imagination. And I had fun writing it. That's it the was main... a challenge, that, that's for sure. That's the main thing. <laughs> how, how did you get on with self-publishing? Did you find it hard? I found that setting up the bank account side of it was the hardest part. Um. It it was difficult, Mark, at first. Um, in, I, I'm in a writer's critique group there. Uh, you know, we read each other's work to each other. And we, we help each other with the grammar and, and the 
the continuity and so on and so forth. And we all came to finish our books around about the same time, and it was like, where do we go now? But fortunately, one of the ladies in the group, she found this company that they that helps authors self-publish and helps um, people get their books off the ground. So we went and met this gentleman. His name's Brian Ruff, also an author. And um, he said, you know, he'd help us get the books copywritten and registered with the copyright office and get the barcodes and help with the cover design and the editing and the layout and all that kind of stuff. And um, so we had a lot of help. If if I hadn't have had that help, I don't know if I would have ever gotten the book off the ground, to be quite honest with you. Um, I mean, they, they were just really helpful. And the alternative of going traditional publishing, writing all of those query letters, and then I was told, you know, it, it could be up to three years, even after you, you've signed a contract before your book gets published. And I thought, well... I don't, I don't want to wait that long, you know. I don't want to get cold feet and I thought, hey, I could be dead in three years, who knows? So I just took the plunge and paid the money, but it isn't easy and all the odds are stacked against you and it's, it's not just a self-publishing mark, as you know, it's what you have to do after that to get your book known is, um, you know, none of us are... Um, Stephen King's or John Grisham's, you know, we're not well known where as soon as your book comes out, everybody's going to rush to the store and buy, buy it. It's hard to get out and self-promote. It's very hard. So I'm sure you know as a self-published author yourself. Yes, uh, I, I put everything I can on my station and, and my, my blog, my Facebook, my Twitter. doesn't mean I'm going to sell a single book. <laughs> Uh, I don't mind. I, I look at it this way. I'm not too worried about the money. I, I just like to produce them. I, I'd have to agree with you. I, I think if if authors go into this, uh, go into self-publishing, hoping to make a million bucks, um, I, I certainly would want to discourage them. I'd say pursue your dream anyway, but... Uh, the, the odds are stacked against you in terms of making a ton of money, um, I like yourself, I just enjoy the creative side, I enjoy putting sorts down on paper, I like the imaginative process, and uh, I enjoy going and talking at various groups, and being on radio shows like yours, and chatting with people, it's, it's a lot of fun, it's an interesting hobby, and I'm hoping that my, my works will get picked up by a TV station um, and be uh, the Chapel Books be a mini series or something like that. But if it doesn't happen, I'm not going to come unglued over it. You know, life will still go on, and uh, it'll still. I'm still pleased I took the journey. It's it's been a wonderful journey with a lot of interesting people. If you did, if that did happen, like Netflix or Amazon come along and said, "Hey, you yeah, would like to make a little vignette." Like six episodes of little, uh, we'll take some of the stories from both books. Um, would you mind if they changed them a little bit for TV? Because obviously sometimes a story might not work on TV as much as it does in a book for obvious reasons. Um, well, I've, uh, I would imagine that's pretty much a given. I, I think we've all seen movies and and then gone and bought the books or, or the other way around, you know, gone and purchased the book and read the book and you go and see it come out on t uh, on a movie uh, screen and you, you go and watch and you think, my God, they certainly took a lot of liberties there. Um, and I've never seen a movie where I've read the book and they've, they've been sort of remained faithful to the book. Um, so... Uh, would I be too upset? Um, probably not too much upset. I think I'd probably just be happy that somebody th thought my book was worthy enough to turn into a, a TV miniseries or a TV movie or a regular movie. So let's talk a little bit about your books one by one. I'll, go, I'll do them in the order that you put them down. The Chapel of Eternal Love, Wedding Stories from Las Vegas. Let's start with that book first. 
Yes. Um, well, as I said, it's, it's all fiction. And essentially, the, the reader will spend a day at one of the wedding chapels here in Las Vegas. It's a fictional wedding chapel, of course. And it's a series of short stories in, in a manner of novel through Rose who's the wedding organizer and a little pet dog buster who happens to be on the cover of the book um, so uh, the, the book opens with how the chapel came into being and um, 50 years ago and we're now 50 years later and Rosemary runs the wedding chapel and she's the wedding organizer and throughout the day different couples come and go and, and they all have their various um reasons for coming here and stories is about the, their backgrounds how, how they come to fall in love and how they come to live in us uh, come to get married in las vegas it's not a romance book per se but it is a book about love because people do fall in love for different reasons and it means different things to different people so there are some it's a fun read it's a very easy read Mark, um, the the vignettes are they're heartwarming. A couple of them are heartbreaking because that's what life is. And there's a couple of humorous ones, and so hopefully the reader does go on something of an emotional roller coaster ride and uh, gets involved in all the the ceremonies and the chapters as they come and go. And much the pleasant surprise of, of uh, one thing I certainly didn't expect was that people would be interested enough to know what happened to the couple's lives after they left the chapel. I mean, to me, what the story was, why they come to the chapel in the first place. Uh, so it was a very, very pleasant surprise when I started getting emails as, when's the sequel coming out? We want to know what's happened to this couple and what's happened to that couple and what happened to the, the pregnant teenager and things like that. Um, it was very humbling and very, very rewarding. And that's the second book uh, is the sequel and it takes place five years down the road and follows the life's journeys of all the couples that were in the chapel. And uh, that was particularly rewarding because it was un where their lives have taken them. So that was a fun write as well. And your, the book after that is... Murder, it's a murder mystery. Yes, The Murder Board of Queen Elizabeth II. I wonder why you based the book on Queen Elizabeth II. Hmm. Basically because that's, <laughs> that's a very famous boat. A ship, I should say ship, not boat. And of obviously the Americans purchased it to be a hotel. Well, um, I it, that that was there's an interesting background to that um, because when I was writing the the chapel book, uh, my business partner and myself we decided to have a dinner party for some of our clients and. Uh, we we're planning the dinner party and he said, you know what? He said, instead of making it just a regular dinner party, why don't we make it a murder mystery evening? And I said, well, you, you know, if you want to, you do say, well, you know, you're the writer, so you write it. And we were a little bit reluctant to try one of those, because I don't know if you have them in England, they, they come in a box, these murder mysteries in a box. But we didn't want to try that. so. I wrote a little sort of short story, if you will, about this Beverly Hills couple celebrating their silver wedding anniversary. And, uh, you know, it was a big grand affair that is extravagant. And, uh, you know, one of the party gets murdered. And it was a fun evening. And after I'd written the chapel books, I thought, you know, I want to take that little story and, and extrapolate on it. And I had been on the QE2 back in the late 1980s and 
that's when I set the book. Um, I didn't know enough about the Beverly Hills lifestyle to write a credible book. So I thought, well, you know, I'm going to keep the same storyline and have it this very wealthy couple celebrating their silver wedding anniversary, but instead of it being in Beverly Hills, it'll take place on the QE2. And as you know, the QE2 has been so many through so many changes, and I believe it's now owned by the government of Dubai. Um, so I had to set it back in the late 80s because the names of all the restaurants and the shops and the sweets and that kind of stuff, I didn't want to be realistic and authentic. And I know they had changed over the years. So um, that's how that book came about. Yeah, I, I also, the QE2 is supposed to be, uh, the Queen Elizabeth II is supposed to be quite haunted as well. A lot of pa paranormal stories. I must confess, um, when I was on it, uh, there was certainly no reports, or there was there was nothing haunted in, in my cabin, that's for sure. And uh, I don't recall any of the passengers recalling about it, it being haunted. I thought it was more the, the Queen Mary that was haunted. I think Queen most... Mary that now resides in uh, Long Beach. Yeah. I think California. most of the most most of these ships have got some sort of connection to them, where some sort of accident would have happened or something mysterious happened. It's you know, it's it's back to the old Ever Christie days. Yes, <laughs> for sure. That's for sure. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, but that was a fun ride, and again. I, I don't know if you have the expression in England uh, over here. It was classified as a cosy mystery. And I have to confess, I'd never heard that expression um, until my book came out. And apparently it indicates a, a book that it is, it is like an Agatha Christie book. You know, there's, there's no... full of intrigue and... Hopefully, is what the murder aboard the Queen Elizabeth II is all about. Um, it's just a, a pure fun book for anybody who likes to sleuth and try and figure out, you know, who, who the victim is. Uh, sorry, who the murderer is. I was saying, this book is. <laughs> you might know the victim. <laughs> well, this book is slightly different because I want to try something different. Um, the murder actually only takes place in this book almost halfway through it. And the reason being is I wanted to introduce the entire cast of characters, and they are a colourful cast of characters. And in, for different reasons, they all have they all have probable cause for bumping off the the, the fell passengers on the on the cruise in the party. So I want it to be like a twofer, you know, where the first part, you know, the reader's trying to figure out which one of this this cast of characters is going to get, uh, be the victim. And then, of course, once the murder takes place, then the second half is going to be, you know, figuring out which one of this this crew did it. So that, too, was a fun, fun ride. They've all been fun rides. And the more recent one is... Discreetly yours. Which I read. I read the first chapter the other day. It was very. I liked it. I quite. I liked the feel of it. Well, that. Well, I, I'm glad you liked that, Mark. Um, that again is another. It's. It's not a murder mystery. We know right at the beginning who's who the victim's going to be. Um, this is about three ladies. They work for an extremely exclusive escort agency in Las Vegas. And the man that runs it is, he, he's really a dog and he treats them like dirt. And one day they finally had enough, you know, he's pushed the envelope a little bit too far. And they come up with what they believe is going to be the perfect crime to get rid of him. 
and the reader actually goes along with the, the plotting and the planning of this crime and the execution of the crime. The mystery is, or the key intrigue is, are they actually going to get away with it? Or have they tripped up somewhere along the way? And did they overlook something? And even more to the point, as you read the book and you read about the reasons why they want to get rid of this guy and they actually go ahead and get rid of Frankie, are you secretly rooting for them to get away with it? Or are you hoping that, hey, they killed somebody, they deserve to go to jail and they deserve everything they get? And um, that's the question that the reader is left with at the end of the day when they find out what are they rooting for, acquittal or or uh, criminal prosecution. And if I can add just a little bit, um, Mark, the inspiration for that book, I, I have to tell you, there was no research done on this book either. Um, in the first book, The Chapter of Eternal Love, I did write one of the chapters, and I, I hope I'm not giving away too much here, but is about an escort who makes some mistake of falling in love with one of her clients and he strings her along for years you know he doesn't want to get married uh, get divorced because of his wife and kids and so on um and i was absolutely amazed at the number of letters that i got about this lady emmy the escort and he ultimately gets divorced and decides to marry emmy and then he leaves her standing at the altar and I got so many letters from women saying, well, what happened to poor Emmy? What happened to poor Emmy? And I was surprised because I thought that Emmy would not be a sympathetic figure for women, um, knowing that escorts might be sleeping with their husbands. But uh, there was a lot of sympathy for Emmy. So I thought, I want to expand on this a little bit and write a full book about three women not they uh, not only are they escorts, but they actually kill off the owner of the agency who runs it. And is there going to be sympathy for them, even if they murder somebody? So that, too, was a very, very challenging ride, as you can well imagine, but a fun one. And have you got anything else in, in planned at the moment? Uh, <laughs> Well, you know, my book's been pretty different so far. They're in multiple genres. And uh, right now I'm writing a Christmas novel. It's actually be a Christmas novella. It will be a, a sort of shortish story. But it's going to be one of those warm, uplifting um, Christmas stories. Again, hopefully it'll get picked up by... Hallmark TV channel. I don't know if you have Hallmark in England, but yeah, yeah, we have over here. It's a yeah, and a Christmas thing. Oh, they, my wife's my, my wife's a great fan of the old Christmas films. She watches them relentlessly oh, okay. to, to the well, point I'm, of me going, I don't want to watch them all. Please, no more Christmas films. <laughs> well, when this when this Christmas book comes out, I'm hoping that it will fall in the hands of of Hallmark and they will pick it up as a Christmas movie because um, it's just going to be one of those warm, fuzzy, feel-good Christmas movies. Yeah. Something different. I think that's the main thing, isn't it? Uh. Yeah, I, I think the writing's got to be challenging. I, I'm not too sure how you find it, Mark, but I would suspect it's, it's the same thing as... It's got to be something that challenges the mind that doesn't just come naturally where you've got to stop and think and create and getting into the feelings of these characters and these people to make them real. It's not necessarily that easy. You know, I think anybody who thinks writing is easy, personally, it didn't come easy or naturally to me, but it, 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 I do thoroughly enjoy it. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I I'm a great, I, I started in... The uh, uh, first book I ever wrote was with um, an occult artist and I helped to do the martial art bits and it's called Cartoon Occult Martial Arts. You see, that's how bizarre that my first book is. And then I got into horror <laughs> horror and that. And I, I, I'm a great fan of 
writing horror bit stories with a little bit of a twist. You know, like a bit of comedy in there somewhere. At the moment, I'm writing one. I'm writing one called Key Worker, and it's got a the 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 the, uh, the uh, evil bo- vi- you know, villain in it is called Vikov. After, yeah, after the <coughs> virus. Well, good for you. Uh, how many books do you have out now? Oh, my God. Uh, what have I got? I've got about, I think I've got about five on Amazon. I started off in the world of Smash Words, and I've done, most of them have done quite well. Uh, it, Smash Bros. was a good way of getting me to used to writing. But I thought I'll put it on Amazon because Amazon's a bit more well known and people can look you up a bit better. Because, you know, people go, oh, Mark Anthony Reigns, oh, yeah, I spoke to him the other day, I'll have a look at one of his books. You know, that kind of thing. So it's like a free promo for myself. <laughs> Well, yeah, well, you, as you it's said, you, yeah. It, it's, no, I was just going to say that the problem with with Amazon that I have is that it's one thing getting your book out there, but people have still got to know you and know that you have books out there. That's where the tough part comes. I mean, there's millions of books on Amazon. Oh my God, yes. You, you look at one and you go, oh, that's probably why we're not selling it. <laughs> I wrote. I, I even wrote. A, I, I even wrote an autobiography for, about myself, called "Diary of an Ex Essex Weirdo." Oh. <laughs> and did you publish it? Yeah, I published it. I published it on Lulu Publishing, and it's on Amazon as well. I got. I did the uh, Lulu's. Am- I. I because I, I wanted one hard copy of my own book. It's not like the best quality ever, but I don't care. I think I did that. Well, it, it, it is an achievement, and you know, as, as you were saying earlier, but self-publishing isn't easy. So, if you've got a book out there that's published, whether it's self-published or traditionally published, it's nothing to be sneezed at. It's an achievement in and of itself. You mean, you know, because you, you started something with nothing and you took it to full fulfillment and unfortunately so many of us start projects and we abandon them, we drop them and so on and so forth and it's it's no small achievement to get a book out there, you know. As you said, getting getting it self published, getting it edited, getting it copywritten, getting that little barcode thing on the back and the whole shebang. It's, oh my God! It's, it's no small feat. Oh, you know, it's, it's a, a lot of work and research to find out how to do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I do a lot of the old um, straight to uh, da, 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 Kindle books because they're they're the easiest way to do it, really. And then, and then, that's that's true. It's uh, it's hard to keep track though on Kindle. Of, you know what's to stop somebody taking it and and just putting it out as a hard copy book? Well, yeah, I've I've tried to cover copyright my books as much as I possibly can without paying for the property of copyright. I've got like a, a public domain ones, you know, that you can get for free. I mean, they don't cover you for everything, but they cover most things. Yes. Well, the, the copyright laws in the in the United Kingdom are probably very, very different from the copyright laws here in the United States. And ours, you have to register your book with a with the Library of Congress, and that's how we go through it over here. And you have to go through and fill out the forms, and then send a copy of the book, or upload a copy of a PDF copy of the book you probably get a free they get probably get through a lot of free books probably but then i get 
I can't imagine that, that people would have time to read all of the books and and you think of the, the sheer volume of books that come out every single year. Oh my God! Yeah. I mean, it's massive. I mean, it's everybody seems to be writing these days, and um, it's nice, nice that people are still reading. You know, still want to read books. Well, it's strange because I've been recently doing. Uh, I do. A lot, I've been trying to do public domain books. I found a because there's quite a few public domain ones out there. I did Frankenstein, and that was quite popular. I'm doing War of the Worlds, and that's very popular. And I'm doing Dracula, which is longer book than I thought it was. Yes. It's a very long-winded yes, book. Yes, I can imagine. Yes. And I did start to do Black Beauty, but it was 42 chapters. I gave up on that. <laughs> oh, yeah. And a Sewell. Yes, that's, that's quite a book. It's quite a lengthy book. Yeah, because when you again you see the series or you see the film, and you're probably thinking, "Well, how did they get forty-two chapters? They must have skipped a lot of chapters." <laughs> well, I think too, it's it's a sign of the times in a way because books, I think, back then were longer. But I mean, you, you look at books like Wuthering Heights or Jane Eyre or any of the. Um, uh, the books by Jane Austen, for example, they're all pretty lengthy. And I think there's probably much more detail and much more narrative, descriptive narrative put into their books uh, than people do now. I think it's just um, the, the way times have changed. I mean, even Charles Dickens' novels, you look at read some of Charles Dickens' novels, and they're massive. And yet they've turned quite a lot of them into stage plays and movies and things like that. And, um, I should look at even Oliver. You know, it turns into a musical, and you take out the music, and the story's about an hour long. But it's a massive book in and of itself. Hmm. Well, and like you say, you, you, and sometimes when you read the book, you, you're thinking... I read, When I read Frankenstein, the actual... The original Frankenstein monster was quite intelligent. He wasn't this non-thinking entity. He was more intelligent than the person who corrected him in, eventually. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what? Hey, have I read the wrong book? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, for sure. <laughs> uh-huh. And I do remember all the controversy because. It was written by a woman. Oh my God! Women can't write. We can't have that. <laughs> yes, yes. Again, the sign of the times. Now look, you get female authors like Danielle Steele, and she comes out with a book, and you know, boom, it's right. It's number one of the the New York Times bestseller list within next to no time. You know, so. You yeah, got to remember, she probably started off like us. And somebody thought, oh, I like that story. And someone else said, oh, I like that story as well. And then it, the word goes round. And once you get word word goes round and you get sort of semi-famous, people go, yeah, I remember him. Oh, yeah, I talked to him last week, yeah. <laughs> and that's how it goes, isn't it? Word of mouth is more powerful than these podcasts or YouTube channels or writing on a blog could ever be. I still think that one of the nicest things is you you go and you speak somewhere in front of a group and some of the people buy your book and all of a sudden you you get a little email saying how much they enjoyed it or how much they gave them pleasure or they were going through a rough time and it just brightened their day or something like that. Um, It's just nice to know that your, your book appeals to somebody or that it made a difference to them um, or they could relate to it. And of course, it, that's almost as, as nice, if not better, than getting a five-star rating on, on Amazon or on your website where people go and post reviews. And it's, of course, it's always great to get 
five star reviews and things like that, of course. But there's something about it when somebody sends you a little personal email and they say, we hope you get this and we hope you read it. Da -da 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 -da. This was going on in my life and I read your book and, and it was just uplifting. It came along at the right time and the right place. And the, that's reward enough. Yeah, I've, 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 had a, I've had a few books like that. Some people um, like send me a book out of nowhere and go, oh, thank you. You know, I never asked for them, you know. I didn't say, oh, could I have a book? But, you know, some people just say, oh, thank you for having me in the show. Da, 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 da. You helped us promote us a little bit. You know, people never quite heard of us before, but they sort of listened in and someone must have said, oh, I have them on my show. You know, sometimes it just works that way, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yes. And especially when you're not expecting it, sometimes things just pop up out of the blue and they're, they're all day brightness, you know, when that happens. All day brightness. Well, well people will be really pop... Well, this one might be really popular, especially with Americans, because they do like an English accent. Yes. Um... Yes, they do. Uh, I, I think that, um, it does help sometimes. It's a double-edged sword in a way because, yes, people do like the accent, but on the flip side is sometimes they're listening to how you're saying things. They're not necessarily listening to what you're saying. And I don't mean that as a put-down. It's, it's just a... I think it's just a reality. Oh, um, yeah, I know what you mean, because... I mean, when I talk, some people go, oh, you don't talk posh then. I thought, well, no, because I come from a council estate. I don't talk posh. Not everybody in London, England talks posh, but nothing wrong with talking posh. But I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, there isn't. But um, before I opened my own computer business, I worked for a company and I was the general manager and it was a small company and at the end of every day, we'd get together and recap events of the day, and we'd sit down, and being the general manager, I'd give a recap of what went on in the sales and in the purchasing and in the invoicing and so on and so forth. Um, and sometimes after 20 minutes, there was a husband and wife team that owned it, and the wife would say, sorry, Stephen, you're going to have to start all over again. I've just been listening to what you how you're saying things and not what you're saying. I haven't been taking it in. I've just been listening to how you talk. And I had to start all over again. And that could be a little bit frustrating. And she didn't mean it unkindly, but, you know, it's just the way it was. So it, it can be a double-edged sword. And can you ask the Americans to stop casting British people as the villains in films? Do that, do they? There's quite a lot of films where the villain, the, the villain is a British person. Uh, Die Hard, one of them. Uh, da, 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 da. Robin Hood. Uh, I'm trying to think now. There's quite a few. Well, that's, you know, I, I, I have to confess, I had never noticed that, Mark. Um, I must pay, pay more attention when I go and, and see some of these movies and who the who, who the villains are. Um, he'll be going, oh, yeah, he, 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 he'll go, yeah, he was right. <laughs> well, I probably will, but I have to tell you, the chance of me getting in touch with an American movie producer and him listening, first of all, that in and of itself is is pretty far off the radar screen. And even if it manifests itself onto the radar screen, the fact that they might listen to my opinion <laughs> is probably slim to none. You never know. Well, true, we, we do never know. We do never know. But I must make sure that um, when I write, if I write another murder mystery, I'll have to make sure that... Uh, uh, the villain of the piece isn't England, uh, uh, isn't an Englishman or an English woman, for that matter. Um, I'm going to take that thought that you mentioned and stick it in the back of my mind because I'd never, as I said, I'd never observed that. 
And while we're here, would you like to mention your where people can go and buy your books? I know you've got quite a few websites you uh, put down, but I thought it'd be better for you to mention them because they're your websites. Well, each book does have its own um, website right now, um, uh, but I do have one that's called. Um, my main one is really my author website, and it can give them the links to all the books. It's www.authorstephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, Murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y, dot com. Hmm. And that's, um, that's the site to go to right now. There's another site I'd like to mention. It's one that started up recently. And for readers right now, I don't know what it's like in England if they can't go out to bookstores. Like here, we can't go out. Our bookstores are all closed. They're considered non-essential. So for, for readers, um, there's a site started up in Las Vegas. It's called One Million Books in 100 Days. And the website address is www.one and million is spelled out. One million books in 100days.com. And there's about 40 local authors who have got their book signed up and they will ship directly all over the world and they are going to give um, a dollar of each book sold to a charity here in Las Vegas, a food bank for the homeless and who are starving and struggling right now. So they're going to take up, um, hopefully it's going to be win, 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 win for the reader, win for the writer and win for somebody who's struggling to put food on their tables right now yes very very times. important uh, issue that i mean i know we we moan over this country how bad we got it but i've seen the news i watched the news from other countries and we're quite lucky really we're just a good well we're all very blessed if we if we wake up in the morning we've got a roof over our head and food on the table and I, I know these are dark days and dark times but uh, we're still truly blessed. We really are. So I think we've discussed nearly everything we want to talk about, Stephen. Unless you want to mention any hobbies you've got, like perhaps you're an international golfer that plays on the moon, or I don't know. <laughs> no, well, you know, I, I enjoy a lot of things. I enjoy going to the theatre and enjoy going to concerts and things like that. I enjoy entertainment, but... Um, it's amazing now how you know the writing has it's become my my main hobby um as i said i enjoy doing the writing i enjoy the creative process i love going and speaking at groups i love going book signings i love doing book signings and people come up and chat and especially here in las vegas you know with the with a book on the wedding chapel it's amazing the number of people come up and they'll say, oh, I got married in Las Vegas wedding chapel, and you hear the, li the whole life story as to how they got married, and I could write, probably write another book on a Las Vegas wedding chapel with some of the stories that people have told me, some being quite interesting and quite fascinating, and they say truth is stranger than fiction, and, yeah, and probably in many ways, Mark, it is. Yeah, it's, I was going to say, it really is. Right, uh, <laughs> Um, now I always ask my I I like to do a, like an unique sign off, so this is a bit why I always say to the guests, Stephen, what is your unique sign off? What is my unique sign off? Yes, you know, like something like a quote or whatever. It's just to prove that I'm talking to you actually live and not. I know it's pre I would pre record oh. it and that, but you know, what I mean, it's. Well. Um, I, I think I, I, I think I would probably say for anybody, just, just go out and pursue your dream. And it doesn't matter whether it happens or not. That's not important. It's the fact that you have goals and you try and reach them and achieve them. And most importantly, believe in them, believe in the dreams and believe in yourself. You, know, you can make it happen. You're the master of your own destiny. Cool. I like that one. This is mine for yours. I was talking to Stephen today about his books, from Los Vegas Way. 
He has no more, he has no exclusives or graphic sex. So if you're looking for that, go elsewhere instead. You can look, you can learn more about the Chapel of Eternal Love and wedding stories galore. And if you like, go to the Queen Elizabeth where you might get involved in a murder. Most mysteries that you can solve. But then it could be discreetly yours. And you may find out more. Anyway, look out for his Christmas book. It's coming out soon. Probably at Christmas. <laughs> talking to me. Well, I have to say, Mark, it's been an extreme pleasure being a guest on your program. I thank you for the invite. And I hope your listeners enjoyed as much as I enjoyed it pairing with you.